in our first year, we used to choke the lab. I mean, there were a lot of students in the lab at the time. And the lecturer with us has to be, you know, shouting, raising his voice. In fact, at the end of the day, some people will not even get to do the lab and so on. To avoid these kind of things, the Russians break down the number of students so that they will understand better. In fact, you can even have a station. You can even have a station to yourself where you have all your beaker, you know, your test tubes and everything so that you can do the lab on your own or even in a group. Hello guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Hassan Kigo. I am a chemical engineering graduate from Russia. Yes, I got my bachelor's in Russia. So in this video, I'm going to attempt to give you how it looks studying in Russia compared to studying in Nigeria. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. How is this studying abroad and how is this studying in Nigeria? Which one is better? Which one is this? Which one is that? So this is what we are going to talk about. If you didn't know, before I went to study in Russia, I actually started studying chemical engineering in Ahmadou Bello University, Zaria. Yes, I've mentioned it a couple of times on my channel. So I had the experience of going through a federal university in Nigeria. I mean, it wasn't easy, it was hectic. I can relate with a lot of people that went to study in a federal university. Lucky enough, I got a scholarship and I left. And the first thing that I noticed when I got there was the difference in the difficulty of our high school education. Like it was pretty clear when we got there. And how did we get to know that? When our physics teacher was teaching us physics, because when we go there, we have to do foundation where they will teach you everything in the Russian language, mass, physics, chemistry, so that you get used to it. After that, they move you to the university where you can understand the lectures in Russian better. So during the foundation years, they were giving us exercises from high school physics, chemistry, and math. So the physics was really difficult for us at some point. And mind you, we were some of the best students coming from Nigeria. In fact, in our midst, there was a guy that had like five to seven A's in his YEC. Like these are some of the most brilliant students in Nigeria from, you know, from the north, from the south. A lot of these guys from southwest. They were there with us in Russia. They got the scholarship. And could you imagine some of the questions were difficult for them that we had to ask the lecturer that, wait, are these questions advanced? Are these questions for university students? And the guy was like, no, these are just questions for high school students. We were really shocked. And that really helped us, you know, work harder to be able to catch up. So after the foundation, the next issue was language. Like in Nigeria, if you're studying, your lecturer says, this is this and that is that you understand it straight away. But in Russian, oh my God, this is like another level of difficulty because when your lecturer says something, the Russians will quickly understand or when they give you assignment, they'll quickly do it. Something that they would do in an hour, it would take you like two to three hours to do the same thing. That was another thing that we had to deal with in the beginning. But later on, we were able to cope with it. By the end of our first year, we were like, okay, in Russian, we could understand our lectures directly even ask questions and so on. And another thing I want to point out is that the courses you take as an engineering student in Nigeria differs from the ones you take in Russia. Like when I was in ABU, I used to take EEN 104, uh, CHEN, like Chen 102. You borrow courses from other engineering departments. In Russia, there is nothing like that. For example, in Russia, they teach you some of those engineering topics under some subjects. Like for example, applied mechanics, this is a, a course in mechanical engineering. So if you're in a Nigerian university, probably you take a course as mech something, but in Russia, they will just call it applied mechanics. They will not tell you that they borrowed the course from an engineering uh, department or something like that. No, you just take the course directly. And another interesting thing that I see people complaining about all the time is uh, the courses that they take. Like me as an engineering student, I might complain that I'm taking a lot of art courses. <laughs> if you go to Russia, you take more art courses as an engineering student than in ABU. When I was in ABU, I think we used to do um, nationalism. We, we studied, I think, is this civic education? I don't think it's civic education. We studied government. We studied English. Like very few number of, you know, art courses. In Russia, you take like close to seven. I took psychology, I took philosophy, I took history, 
There's one they call pravavidani. I don't know what they call it in English. It's like government or law. I took it. I took culturologia. This is like my best. I think that's culturology, something like that. That was like five. I don't know. I've lost count. You get the idea. And the reason why we study a lot of these art courses is because when you're going for a bachelor education, you're not just studying your own course. You're like trying to be educated around, you know, all fields. That is why you take all those courses. So there's no reason to actually complain because you're going to get whole education after your bachelor's. Then the next one is a lot of people say that abroad you do more practicals than in Nigeria. I would like to say that is true. And uh, I've had a first-hand experience of that. For example, in Russia, every subject you're taking is broken into two or three. Let's take math, for example. You have a math lecture class, and then you have the math practica. They call it practica. That's a practical class. In the lecture class, the lecturer will come. He'll teach you about differential calculus, whatever. You explain it to everybody in the lecture hall. Then when you go for the practical class, he's going to break it down. All the topics that he discussed in the lecture, you bring it down, uh, you know, break it down, give you exercises, you know, classwork, assignments in the practical class. And that will like foster understanding. This is something that we didn't have in ABU. Let's take chemistry, for example. Chemistry is broken into three. There's the lecture class, there's the practica, and then there's the laboratories and yet that's the lab, lab work. The same thing, lecture, they explain the concepts. Practica, they, you do calculations, you calculate the mole, you know, Avogadro's number, whatever, you calculate a lot of these things. And then the lab class is where you do experiments. In a week, you might have like five to, I don't even know how many, five to six lab classes. Maybe today you do two, tomorrow you do another one. So we do a lot of labs while studying in Russia from the first year to your last year. Meanwhile, in ABU, we didn't used to do a lot of labs like that. And maybe that is because I left early. Because I left in my second year. So I don't know how it is in the later years. But while I was there, we didn't take a lot of labs. So this is why I say we do more practicals abroad than in Nigeria. To add up to that, after every first semester, we do winter practice. Because after the first semester is around December, January, this is when we do winter practice. Like two weeks to the end of the holiday, we go to the lab. Everybody, like all of us, we go to the lab. We do practicals, practicals till we resume. When we resume, we are going to submit a report. This is something that we don't do in federal universities. I know we do CIOS and we do IT. This one, they do it every year. So my first year, I did it. After in my second year, I did it. My third year, I did it. And then my fourth year, this is where you might go for IT or you do lab work in the university. Then another thing I would like to point out is how... The Russians give attention to how many people are in a class at a time. From our first year, you know how it is now. When they admit a lot of students, there will be a lot of students, yes. So in our first year, we used to have a lot of people in the class, maybe like 100 or something. But one thing I like about them is that it's only in lectures that you see a lot of people like that. From your first year, they will break you down into groups. And then those groups too will be broken down into subgroups. A group will be at, at most 30 students. The subgroup will be like at most 15 students. So when you're in lectures, they teach you everything, yes. But like I told you, there's a practical class where they go and they break it down to you to understand. In the practical class, they are usually not more than 30. You see, they're trying to like control the number of students in the class so that they can understand better. Then when you go to the lab, you can't go 100 or something to the lab now. Even 30 in the lab is, is much so you go like in 15 or in 20, 20 at most, sorry. This is something that my university in Nigeria didn't have. In our first year, we used to choke the lab. I mean, there were a lot of students in the lab at the time. And the lecturer with us has to be, you know, shouting, raising his voice. In fact, at the end of the day, some people will not even get to do the lab and so on. To avoid these kind of things, the Russians break down the number of students so that they will understand better. In fact, you can even have a station. You can even have a station to yourself where you have all your beaker, you know, your test tubes and everything so that you can do the lab on your own or even in a group. Another interesting thing that I forgot to mention is how they deal with courses over there when someone fails, God forbid. In ABU, for example, if you fail a course, you carry it. 
you can only fix it when the semester rounds up. Let's say you fail a course in your first semester, you have to wait for the next first semester before you can fix it. That's one, two. Or you can spill. When you fail a course that is a prerequisite, meaning you have to pass it before you take the next course. So if you fail it, you can't take the next course until you, you know, fix it. So it automatically there's an additional year to your, let's say you're, you're studying for five years, so you'll be studying for six years because of that additional course. This is spill if you don't understand. In Russia, thank God, they don't have anything like that. <laughs> if you fail a course, you have an opportunity even before the semester rounds up to go and meet the lecturer for him to sit you for the exam again. You don't have to go through the first semester again. No, you try and write the exam again. If you fail, they will give you another chance. If you fail, then they will take you to commissia. This is like a commission. This is like a panel of lecturers relating to that course. Let's say it's physics, someone has been failing. They will arrange a panel of physics lecturers where you will come and defend the course to them without your physics teacher. Because this is also going to avoid a lot of the issues that we have in Nigerian universities, for example, where you see a lecturer failing his students intentionally for a variety of reasons. In Russia, when that happens, they separate the teacher and the student and they take the student to the panel and he defends the course to the panel. If he passes, then he continues. If he fails, this is another critical part. If you keep failing, they might kick you out of the school. Depending on how lenient your school is, they might kick you out. Then the last one that I think I should mention is how we deal with books. I can remember when I was in ABU, I used to go to the library a lot. But in Russia, you don't even have to be going to the library that often. When you come as a new student, you go to the library and you tell them your course. They're going to give you the books that you need for all your courses that you can take them home. When you're done with the semester, you bring the books back. I mean, that's so cool. You don't have to spend a lot of money buying books. Though I understand it to be very hard to do this in a federal university where you have thousands and thousands of students in the school at a time. I'm sure it will be difficult for you to do that. Now, this is not the first time I experienced some of my experience as a student in Russia. So check out this video where I talked about my experience in Russia. And also check out this video where I gave a story of how I got scholarship to study in Russia. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this video gave you an insight of how it is to study in Nigeria and in Russia. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Signing off now. See you on the next one.